Our next speaker is Bill Cook. Um, I've known Bill for uh, many years. Uh, we're good friends. Uh, Bill has visited us at uh, Princeton, and uh, he's traveled many, many places over the course of his career. California, Georgia, Pennsylvania, Ontario, <laughs> I forget, maybe some other places. And so I consider him the, a traveling academic. And so it makes sense that he would be interested in um, the traveling salesman problem. And uh, so that's what he'll talk about today. Go ahead, Bill. All right. Thanks, Bob. It's, 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 it's great to be home. Uh, so I had my undergraduate degree from Rutgers. I had courses from Fred Roberts, Bill Steiger, Pavel Hell. It was Pavel that set me off to, to graduate school. Dymex was also the, the home of their early TSP research. So I was a member of, of Fan Chung's group at Bellcore. David Applegate worked at Bell Labs, and Vasha Kwato was, was here at Rutgers. So the traveling salesman problem, it's easy. What's the shortest circular route to visit the four original Dymex sites? <laughs> right? right? Uh, yeah, it's funny. That's crazy easy. Except the problem arises in context where there's very many points to visit. So in logistics, but also in, in genetics, machine scheduling, data analysis, Pretty much any time you want to put something in order, there might be a TSP that you need to solve. So what I'm showing are, are some of the companies that obtained license to use our Concord solver, our Concord TSP code. One of the requirements before I give somebody a license is that they tell me how they're going to use it. That way, every week or so, I get a new class of application, which is really nice. It keeps the problem lively. But it's only part of the interest in the problem. The, the traveling salesman problem also serves as a focal point to discuss are there limits to computational power? So it's a poster child for computational complexity. For example, this uh, past winter, the World Economic Forum in Davos came out with a report on the future of supercomputing. Their one-line description talks about the traveling salesman problem. Or D-Wave, the quantum computing company, in advertising for their multi-million dollar machines, focuses on the TSP. And the powerful Wolfram language, when they organize a big press conference to talk about it, the first problem they talk about is a traveling salesman problem. I should point out that actually the, the software that Steve, Stephen Wolfram is talking about is our Concord code. We gave them license included in Mathematica. All right, so it really is this poster style for complexity. And that, I think, is because it goes back to the origins of the problem. So, the TSP was stated as an optimization problem first by Carl Menger, so the Menger theorem Menger, the Menger sponge Menger in Vienna. And he stated the problem and he immediately focuses on the critical issue. Do you need to look at every tour to solve it? Because it's not a question of whether there's a solution algorithm for the TSP. Right? You could just list all the tours. But it takes forever that way. Can you do better? Can you solve the problem with limited computational resources? And this is a, a deep question. You have to keep in mind this is before Turing. This is before any notion of, of complexity theory. Now, of course, it's wrapped up in, in, in the great P versus NP question, right? One of, one of the great open problems in mathematics. So uh, you can frame it as, as, is there a polynomial time algorithm for the TSP, which is a completely open, except for in the popular press, it's already been decided and it's game over for the traveling salesman, right? So 50 points will take you to the end of the universe. The Washington Post reports that 22 points will take you 1,000 years. In Italy, don't even think about trying to solve a 20-point problem. <laughs> you know, and, and these comments raise a serious question. If I have a traveling salesman problem, this particular example, is it impossible for me to solve it? Right? This is independent of P versus NP. Right? That, that's a beautiful thing about asymptotics. I'm talking about I have this particular problem. And there's been a whole line of work going along parallel to the complexity theory dealing with this. I call it the get it done faction. And, and it started with Hassler Whitney. Now, Hassler Whitney is a god in discrete mathematics. He's an inventor of matroids. For the TSP, in 1934, he gave, so four years after Menger, he gave lectures in, in Princeton where he takes Menger's sort of abstract geometric problem and, and, and brings it home. But he talks about the problem of finding a shortest route to 48 points in the United States, so the 48 states problem. And this had a big impact on the field. For example, the, the first paper that uses the traveling salesman problem by name was by Julia Robinson. 
And Julian Robinson is a, is a towering figure in the pure math world. She, she's best known for leading the team that solved Hilbert's 10th problem. For the TSP, though, she doesn't talk about asymptotics. She's looking at the mathematics to help solve small finite examples, so 50 points. And her work had a direct impact on the most important paper in this area, certainly. This was by Danzig, Folkson, and Johnson, who actually solved Whitney's 48 states problem. They solved it by hand. So this is something that's widely reported in journals these days that's impossible for a supercomputer. They solved it by hand. And their main tool was Danzig's linear programming model. So optimizing a linear function subject to inequality constraints. Now, linear programming is one of the great accomplishments of the applied math of the last century. You, you pretty much can't pick up a product where LP is not used in its design, manufacture, or distribution. And his simplex method for solving LP problems was named one of the top 10 algorithms of the century for its wide scale use. And much of that use you can trace back to that TSP paper because they showed how to handle linear programming problems with very many constraints using something called the cutting plane method that, that I'll introduce. And that allowed a, a great increase in, into the scope of, of application of, of linear programming. So I'll try to describe the cutting plane method for the TSP using geometry, which is an idea of, of Mikhail Younger and, and Bill Pulibank to do it this way. Right, so this is a pretty picture. I generated this uh, tour through 50 points using the cutting plane method. And that picture is not just pretty, that proves the tour as short as possible. Let me zoom in on it. So you see around each point I have a, a blue disc. And a salesman to visit that point has to cross the disc twice. Right, and, and you have these regions like that yellow band. A salesman has to cross this band at least twice. So twice the width of the bands plus twice the width of the disc is a lower bound on a TSP. Every tour has to be that long. And this tour exactly matches that bound, so it's optimal. Now, you, you, I could convince you of that by getting you a good ruler and you can go out and measure everything. But, but you don't need to do that. Just two facts will convince you. The first is, each one of those regions is crossed exactly twice by that tour. Second is, each edge in the tour is completely covered by the regions. Those two facts means that the two numbers are the same. And that, that's a fact of realization of John von Neumann's linear programming duality theorem. The, the, this is the geometric representation of the duality theorem for that particular linear programming problem, subtor LP. So I have a variable for each edge that tells you whether the edge is going to be used in my tour or not. And you have two types of constraints. The blue ones state that if you pick any point, the sum of the edges has to be exactly two, because that's what a tour does. And that corresponds to the, those blue regions. The red ones say that you have any subset of points, you have to pick at least two edges in the cut, given by the subset. And that gives you those bands. So this is a realization of the LP duality theorem, and I solved it. Now, of course, I didn't solve it with a simplex algorithm. There's, there's a constraint there for every subset. It's like two to the 50 of them. You can't even write down all those inequalities. There's exponentially many inequalities. So I have no hope of solving it with the simplex algorithm. But the cutting plane method can handle it. Because the cutting plane method, what it does is you generate inequalities on the fly. You first solve your LP over a small subset. And then if that solution happens to satisfy all your other inequalities, well, then you're home. If it doesn't, you add some of those to your LP, resolve, and repeat. So you solve the LP, check if you satisfy your, in, all your inequalities. If you don't, you add some. So I'll show you the steps for that 50 point problem. So I solved the initial LP. Each picture will show you the dual solution and the primal solution as the rounds go by. So the, the, those regions get more complicated, but it gradually allows you to have more and more of these edges that are being covered. And after seven steps, it gets a tour. Hey, it's such really cool, right? It's seven rounds of these cutting planes. It handled two to the 50th inequalities. And it's not lucky you give me a million points. It also stops quickly. Except for it's lucky in the sense that there's no polynomial bound that it will converge. Right? That, that's a big disappointment, big weakness, theoretical weakness in this whole approach. There's no polynomial version of the cutting plane method here. Now, you might say, all right, well, hell, Bill, you're not going to get a polynomial algorithm. There, there's exponentially many inequalities. But the, the number of inequalities doesn't really play a role. Right? Uh, so a very similar linear programming problem was solved in polynomial time by Jack Edmonds in his iconic work on the perfect matching problem. 
And I want to show you, I, I code it up as an app. I'll show you running on a 100-point set. Uh, it's set to music because that's how, I, that's how I, I wrote the app, I time the iterations to the music. There should be, should be volume here. So, so you see what's happening is that the green regions are getting bigger, the red regions are getting smaller. So Edmonds doesn't catastrophically change the LP solution, he changes it gradually. He finds a green one, then a red one, green one, red one. There's always more greens than red. So at each step, the total bound is increasing. Eventually it covers enough space so that he can match all the points. So again, the, the, the same argument shows that this is optimal. The only difference is, that Edmonds only entraps an odd number of points. Because in a matching, you can't perfectly match uh, internally an odd number of points. So it has to cross the border. So that's a geometric proof. OK. Unfortunately, we don't have such an algorithm for, for the, for the subtor LP. That would be beautiful if we did, but we don't. We don't have a polynomial method like that. But of course, in the get it done faction, well, we have the cutting plane method. This is how the cutting planes handle that same 100 point set. Yeah, so in six iterations, it solved the LP. That's great, but, but the regret here is that it didn't solve the traveling salesman problem. Because the linear programming problem can have variables that take on fractional values. And that's where these red edges you see, they're carrying the value half. And that's a big problem, right, if you want to solve the TSP. The dancing folks in Johnson cure is to use more cunning planes. There's nothing special about those subtour inequalities. All I need is any inequality that is satisfied by all the tours and violated by the LP solution. So it cuts off the LP solution. The theoretical justification is the old theorem of Minkowski, convex analysis. You can frame it as saying any discrete optimization problem has a perfect LP formulation. Edmonds, in his brilliant work on matchings, knows the perfect LP formulation for matchings. We unfortunately don't know it for the TSP, even for 10 points. No one knows the complete LP formula formulation for 10 points. So what does Danzig, Folks and Johnson do? Well, they're in just the get it done faction. They have an LP solution. They, they, they roll up their sleeves and they stared at it until they found by hook or crook some inequality. So you see how they solve this, this 48 states problem. I can solve it with only using nine inequalities. So this is the start and in just nine steps, not rounds of cut shotting, one inequality, it'll eventually produce an LP solution that's a tour. It's an optimal Right, something that we're saying is just completely impossible, they solve it just by hand, finding those inequalities. And this was the, the big start of the, of the big push expansion of the use of linear programming. Because they showed how to solve, use linear programming to solve a discrete problem, to solve a Timex problem. Right? They, they can now, this is applied to wide classes of NP hard problems, including, most importantly, integer programming, which has a big economic impact. So it's a marvelous paper. It's also marvelous, their final line in the paper says, well, perhaps it might be useful. Right, that's modest. This is the most important paper ever written in the screen optimization. Right? It says, well, maybe it's okay. Uh, for, for the traveling salesman problem itself, there was a, a big increase in the size of problems that could be solved once people finally understood what they were doing. So there, this, what I'm plotting here is the world record solution, the largest challenge instance that's ever been solved. And I plotted on a log scale. So you see, starting in the 70s, it's going up in a nice line. So we're having exponential increase. Since 1992, all of the records have been solved by the Dimex team. So Applegate, Bixby, who was from Rice, but a frequent visitor to Dimex, uh, Quatel, myself. The most recent two solutions were also together with Daniel Espinosa, Marcos Gucullier from Chile, and Kel Helsken from Denmark. The 100,000 problem is actually a three-dimensional problem. I have to thank Bob Vanderby for pointing me to this data set. So it's a 3D positions of stars. It's a 3D, 3D traveling salesman problem. This is the shortest possible tour through 109,000 points. It, it took quite some time to compute that. But there's this trickle-down effect. So the world record solution before 1992 was some 2,000 points. 
And that instant solves in 18 seconds on, on this iPhone 8. Right, so by targeting these large instances, we're having a nice trickle-down effect. So there's definitely been progress in this get-it-done faction. But of course, the newspapers say if you have more than a handful of points, nothing you can do. Hey, I, I, I can sympathize them a little bit, right? Because you notice I, I, I plotted those world record solutions. There weren't many of them. So maybe we're just overfitting just for those examples. Right? So to, to counter that, I said we, we also solved 100 million random problems. So there are points in the unit square, random ones, where there's straight line distance, or the straight line distance on a torus where we identified the squares. There are between 10 points and, and 2,000. The reason we did that uh, was to do an investigation of, 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 of a constant, a mathematical constant that no one knows the value of. So this is a team led by, by Jillian Beerwood. And what they showed is that if you put n points in the unit square, so n goes off to infinity, the alpha and tor length is, is going to be beta times the square root of n, with probability one. Right? And, and, but they don't know what beta is. They gave a rough approximation, and it's only been proved by epsilon since 1959. No one knows that value. So we wanted to experiment, at least to try to get an estimate, a computational estimate. And our, the data we accumulated, it really takes, shows that problem come to life, that the result come to life. So what I plotted here is a histogram for 50. So I divided the tour lengths by square root of 50, and it gets a nice normal distribution, but with a big variance. Now, I'll, write a, I'll, I'll run a movie that, that will slowly increase it up to 2,000. What you see is that the, the mean will move to the left, but the variance will go down very quickly. And, and the bit with theorem is that will continue and eventually spike to one value beta. We just don't know what beta is. But because we have this nice monotone decrease, we could get an a asymptotic estimate. So this was together with Dave Applegate, David Johnson, and, and Neil Sloan. All right, this is not a theorem. This is just a target for a theorem. Uh, but why I'm talking about it now is we solved the, every, all 100 million examples. It's not like we missed some of them and had to replace them. We generated 100 million test instances, test instances and solved every one. All right. But again, pretty much every newspaper in the country and in Europe and other places in 2015 reported you can't possibly solve a 50-point problem. Again, a little bit on their side is what they were talking about was somebody had a problem where they're traveling to historic sites in the U.S. by car. All those test instances are straight lines. And in those big challenge instances, only two of them were road networks. Two small ones came from atlases. Everybody else was a Euclidean problem rounded to the nearest integer. That, that, that's the data set. All right, so in response to that, together with uh, Danielle, Marcos, and Keld, we saw not over 50 points, but over 50,000 points in the U.S. historical sites. And the, we didn't take the straight line distance. We took the Google map walking distance from A to B. <laughs> so, so it's walking because uh, I wanted them to be symmetric, but B to A is the same as A, A to B. And, and, and our theorem is that the shortest length has 350 million meters, and you can't even shave off one meter. That's the optimal tour. Uh, and I quite like the complexity of it. So the, you have this global TSP, but when you zoom in, you have the complexity of Google's shortest path. So this is how that tour visits the, the mall area. There's, this, there's, there's a curvy path if you've ever taken it up to see the Washington Monument. Yeah, I quite like that. All right, this required us to develop quite a number of techniques. Uh, but I'd like to mention just one of them, because it's something that, that might quickly occur to you as a problem. That Google doesn't have a big book. I mean, I think the young people here don't even know what an atlas is. It used to be this, maps used to be this sort of abstract geometric re representation of a, of a map, of a, of a geographic place. And they used to have these tables that had, had, had distances in them. Google doesn't have that. Google has an algorithm, right? They compute the shortest paths, so it's costly. So at the time, which was a couple years ago, they allowed us 2,500 queries per day. Well, there are four of us at home and office. We get 20, 30,000 a day. But you're not going to get 50,000 in your lifetime, 50,000 squared in your lifetime. So you have an optimization problem where you can't even look at the data. So to handle that, I, I developed a technique I call cost refinement. That I have to make an assumption that Google's distances are not cheating, meaning that the walking distance is no, sh no shorter than the geometric distance. Uh, that only makes sense. So the geometric distances give you a lower bound on the Google distances. Therefore, I can equip my LP problem with the geometric distances, and it still gives me a lower bound. 
So I can still use that. So what I do is, as I'm running a cutting plane play method on the fly, I ask Google for the distances for the variables that are important in my LP problem. I, I don't ask them for all n squared of them. I just ask them as they arise. So, you know, the point of adding a cutting plane is to improve the LP bound. The point of asking Google for distances is to improve the LP bound, because the values are probably going to be greater. All right, so this is, uh, the concept is easy. To engineer it on this scale it could, took quite a lot of work. We, but we ended up solving with about 2 million edges, which sounds like a lot, but it's not 50,000 square. And developing techniques that had to work on smaller problems along the way. The largest of those had some 50, uh, 25,000 points. In, in the UK, there were locations of pubs. <laughs> right, so it's a bit, no one cares about this history tour, but once uh, I posted this on my website, newspapers in the UK found out about it. And, then I suddenly start getting bombarded by messages from people like Matty Boy 19 and Meat Beep, uh, all telling me my tour is crap, right? And, and again, it's as short as possible down to the last meter, but it missed their favorite pub, right? Because I won in 25,000, it's a warm-up exercise. So I took this big database and I, I kicked out everything that to me didn't sound like a pub, a hotel or motel in it, kicked it out. What that meant there's kicked out almost every place to get a drink in Scotland. And the Scots let me know, bless, bless their hearts. Uh, yeah, but you know, I'm an applied mathematician. Uh, if they want more pubs, we give them more pubs. So I, I took the full database, some nearly 50,000 pubs. And in this past year, we solved that. Uh, and this gives quite good coverage. This is the, up, even up the North, Northern Isles, we used to have one point, now we have many. You have to get from pub to pub by ferry. Uh, um. All right, so that's the ultimate pub crawl. But it's not the end of the line for the TSP. Um, you can always go bigger. And so the, currently the largest problem that, that we're, we're making a serious attempt to solve is another problem from astronomy. So it comes from the European Space Agency. It's the 3D coordinates for some two million points. Uh, here we can't solve it, but we have a tour that's 28 million parsecs. Well, maybe there's a tour that's 225 shorter. So it's not quite optimal. So if you take the ratio of our bounds, that's five goose eggs in the approximation, five zeros. Uh, I, I should point out that in discrete opposition, four zeros is the gold standard. So CPLEX, Groby, commercial codes, they stop when they get the fourth good thing. So, so we're order of magnitude beyond that. Still, we're pushing it because we're learning stuff. That, that's the point. And what we're learning is to somehow try to handle these linear programming problems. So simplex method becomes the bottleneck, taking 99% of the time. So I said, well, I can replace it by, by, by Bob's interior point code. We well, can do that, but we're shopping a whole sequence of LPs, and I can't get any speed up when I restart the whole thing over again. All right, so the bigger thing is, well, let's hope that somebody comes up with some new, uh, somebody in, in the algorithms community comes up with a new sim method, new variant of the simplex method. But there's been literally no progress in, in, in computational techniques for the simplex method in, in 25 years. So what do we do? Well, we don't know how to do that, so we just randomize. So, it sounds crazy, but what I do is I, I run 32 cores, the cutting plane method, with some randomization built in, and I burn down 24 of them every, every morning and restart those with the best of the remaining ones. So the simplex method is not running very well, so I, okay, I run 32 copies of it. It seems crazy, but see, the simplex method is take, doing this path on a polytope, and it gets to some nasty parts where it can't do so well, and so I'm just getting rid of those. Um, all right, so that's what we're learning there. If we, if we take that up a step, the, the Gaia mission made a data release too with 1.3 billion stars. So we took the 100 million closest to Earth. Uh, here we only have three digits of, of precision, but here we're learning something different. This LP is just way too big to even possibly drive the simplex, uh, to drive the cutting plane method. So what we're doing is we're running the simplex method on overlapping local regions, running it for quite a long time. But the only thing it's doing is generating cutting planes. I gather them all together and it's have a single LP problem, and that we approximately solve with the first order method. And it gives us a dual solution that we convert to a valid dual solution, it gives us a bound. Uh, this is actually only a warm up exercise. We actually want to do the whole 1.3 billion. Um, currently, we just have a, a weak bound, two, only two digits, two goose eggs, from a heuristic packing of the dual solutions. But we're setting things up by the end of this year. We hope to solve it on a large Google Cloud machine to, to get get at least a third goose egg for that approximation. All right, so we're going big. That's why Google's into it. Google doesn't really want to visit 
1.3 billion stars, or maybe they would, but they're not going to be able to. Um, uh, they want to solve big LP problems. And, and uh, so well, I'm trying to convince you that you should also work on, on the TSP. So, so, so why should you? Well, we're learning things, like we're learning how to solve work with big LP problems. And, and that's the main point as a community. Most of the workhorses in discrete optimization were discovered by people working on the TSP. So branch and bound, the first branch and bound papers on the TSP, cutting claim method, simulated annealing, all came from TSP research. So as a community, it's clear, I think, why we should work on the TSP. But why should you work on the TSP? Well, I can say that our colleague, Bob Bixby, he parlayed his, his TSP work into making the two most successful integer programming codes. And he has picked up huge stacks of money along the way. So he's currently floating in a yacht uh, uh, off the coast of, a big yacht, off the coast of, of California. Ola Swenson won $100,000 for the Michael Held Prize for his work on approximating the, the asymmetric traveling salesman problem. Kelt Helskin and I won the end of year, end of year Kaggle competition. So if you never competed in Kaggle, it's not like academic research, right? This is hectic. You, you have 1,800 uh, teams all competing on the exact same data set. Whoever gets the best solution wins the money. And, and when we post our solutions, there's these bulletin boards and, and public forums, and everyone is trash talking us, saying that there's no way with our old time techniques they will hold out. And, some of the top ranked coders in the world were posting up big scores. But in the end, we won all three, three versions of the competition. We won $17,000, the, the maximum possible to win. So if you want to win Kaggle competition, study the TSP. If you want to meet your head of state, you should solve the TSP. These are five prominent TSP researchers, all with their prime ministers, their, their presidents, or their, their, their uh, chancellors. But the most important reason, I think, uh, goes back to what Richard Feynman said to young Nikos Christofides. So he, he, Christofides met Feynman by accident in Stanford. And he asked, Feynman asked what he's working on. He says, the, the, the traveling salesman problem explains what it is. Next day, Feynman comes back and says, uh, you're right, it's a hard problem. Have fun, kid. Right? And it's right, this is a nice geometric problem. You can have fun working on it. For example, Richard Karp, the great computer scientist, has this amazing portfolio of results. But in his Turing Prize lecture, he says the most thrilling thing was the night that, that his and Michael Held's, uh, same Michael Held that, that sponsored that prize, by the way, the same Michael Held, um, uh, he and Held had these numbers coming out of their computer. Or Howard Kuhn, the great optimizer from Princeton, Karush Kuhn Tucker Kuhn, says he worked on the TSP for 48 years. So that's to be something there. Or Christoph Pasmetrio says it's not a problem, it's an addiction. Right? And, and he's right, I'm certainly addicted, but, but I don't think it's a, an addiction we want to cure. In fact, just the opposite. If I could get little TSP challenges and put them on wrappers of candy, I'd toss them out the schoolyards. Right? Uh, because there's certainly going to be optimization breakthroughs on the, on the horizon. We just need to get new ideas. And the TSP really crystallizes what's important about difficult optimization problems. So it's something that I hope you might consider taking up as, as a challenge. Thanks. Uh, I mean, uh, there's some hope. I mean, these, these, as I said, these LPs are very large. There's one at the end where it's a first order method, but maybe some exact method could handle this problem. That, that I, don't, I don't know. This is a big scale. Uh, but it is also true that interior point methods, so this cutting plane method, you think of it as a polytope. You're cutting off a vertex. Cut off a point in the middle of the face, that would be better, right? right? Uh, you're more likely to improve your solution quickly if you have a point in the middle of the face and you cut it off. So, so there's some chance that interior point methods could help, but in our current, current versions, except for these really big problems, we just stick with the simplex algorithm. Restarts are hard. What's that? Restarting is hard. Yeah, restarting is, it, oh yeah, that, that's the point of restarting, you're literally a, 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 an interior, and so, uh, you know, you had a cutting plane, well, you're not interior, your point's not in there anymore. So if, if you go to general metric spaces built, what's the largest number of points that you know you could solve? general metric space. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, it, 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 so it's a little bit strange that the, uh, the 2D, 3D problems seem to be 
easier than the 2D problems. So I was just curious about that, so I tried the 11D because of the string theory. The 11D problems are definitely easier than, than the 3D problems. Um, so I, I, I don't know why it was that. It's something to do with, with the neighborhoods. Uh, I, I'm not, not entirely sure. So um, I, you, you, can, you can, people have designed problems with just a couple hundred points that we can't, the default version of code can't solve. Uh -huh. okay. they, they carefully and they thought about it over you know, many months. They wrote a paper on it, put, put it on the archive, papers, hard problems for Comcore. I think it was actually just a plus sign. It was, something, it was a very simple geometric thing that I could have put in inequalities that would solve it right away, but the way I'm doing it, uh, I currently can't. Any other quick questions? Yes, here we go. <clears throat> Is there a phase transition in TSP or at a point where it's hard, so you can generate hard random problems? Dana would know. I, I, I mean, uh, uh, <coughs> so so I don't know. The, 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 if you just give random weights to the edges, they tend to be easy. So so if you're literally just giving a uniform number on the edges, that'll be easy. Whether you can somehow not have them quite uniform and make it hard, I, that, that I don't know. So certainly, zero one problems are pretty hard. You can find a, a non-Hamiltonian graph that's pretty hard to prove it's not. A in fact, the only example we know that, that guarantees to take exponential time for our code is that. It's, a non, it's Basha Quattas, these non-Hamiltonian graphs. We can prove that, it, that this type of approach takes exponential time. Time for one last question. I think we should, uh, oh, we should cut it off. Yeah. Okay, yes. Thank you very much. Thank you.